I have a lesson for you. Can you do addition? What is one and 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 one and, one and two? Can you do subtraction? Eight from nine and two from eight and six from three and one from seven two? Can you do division? Six divided by a three and then a two? Yes, you. Can you multiply, my dear? Then what are three times six and two times ten? And then again. Addition. Subtraction. Division. Hey, everybody. Uh, uh, yeah. It's time for the Bonanza. Bonanza. Bonanza! That was good work. You like that? We just did that right here, right on the spot. We didn't even plan that. No, that's that's how we do things on this show. We Sunday do, School Bonanza. We do do things on this show. Yes, uh... Welcome to Sunday School Bonanza, everyone. Hi, nice hello. Nice to be here. Brought to you by This Week in Mormons. That's us. Here we are. Okay, so this week, we'll jump right in because, as you know, we are adamant about our 10 minutes or less policy. Someday we will honor it. <laughs> We're like the government. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this... So this week, the lesson, it's on uh, lesson number 29. The number of disciples was multiplied. Yes. So this week we deal with some multiplication, some division. Long division, I hope. Subtraction, addition. (laughs) And for those of you who want to get technical, we might throw a Pythagorean theorem in there later on. Is zero really a number? We'll find out this week. Today. On the bananas. So okay. uh, what we're dealing with here today, we're of course still in the book of Acts. Uh, most of today is found in Acts 6, 7, 8, and 9. Okay? So a lot of great things that we cover. Uh, namely, we talk about uh, this, basically the origins of the 70, for lack of a better term, being called uh, the martyrdom of Stephen, Philip doing some preaching, and Saul becomes Paul. So a lot going on this week. So I'm going to dive right in here. Yes. Uh, the first section here, of course, is seven men are ordained to supervise uh, the work of the church. So it's kind of fun because at this stage in the game, the, the work was expanding quite a bit in the church. Uh, there was a lot of growth. I mean, you had mem- you actually had branches of the church among the Hebrews, among the Greeks. It, it had spread quite a bit over there in the eastern Mediterranean region. But, of course, this presents some challenges. For example, we find in Acts 6.1... It says right here, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Bum, bum, bum. So it's interesting to think about this. At this early stage in the game, there was already a little bit of derision in the church because there were disagreements on how things should have been done. Um, And I think this is uh, the main reason why we see, because we see this today in the church, obviously, just as well. Um... And so there's a quote here by Howard W. Hunter. He said, it, it is an understanding and accepting, or it is in understanding and accepting the universal fatherhood of God that all human beings can best appreciate God's concern for them and their relationship to each other. There's a little that, bit more after that. That doesn't make any sense to me. That quote doesn't make any sense to me at all. I read that quote and I was like, come on, what, Howard? What How does it not make sense? It is an understanding and accepting the universal fatherhood of God of all of us that can help us appreciate God's love and concern for us. How does that not make sense to you? Well, well, sure. All right. So, like, we understand and accept that God's our Father and that... That That should be a unifying factor is what we're aiming for here. Okay. And in the same notion, those of us in the church today, we should be more unified. So the point is the apostles, as you might imagine, were, you know, overwhelmed. They had too much going on. And so... Well, no, I wonder wonder if that was the the case, though. Well, like, all right, so so that that probably was true. But I'm, I'm curious if it was something similar to, like, they get the call and they know... Similar to, like, what missionaries go through today, right? Where the foreign call is very glamorous and exotic and exciting, but staying at home, that's not quite so fun. I don't want to go to Des Moines. And so <laughs> I, like, I, I wonder if that was a little bit of the case. So they get the call and immediately they're like, 
we're going to Wales. Off we go to England. I want to get out of here. We're going, you know, let's let's go and true. spread well, well, this. Well, and part of the point is what you're saying right here, that they felt the need to go and spread the gospel as the 12. So they called seven men to look after more of the temporal affairs of the church. And this is what we see in Acts 6. So, so that's yeah. the gist of that there. Uh, they might ask you some questions. What organizational changes has the Lord inspired Latter-day leaders to make as the church has grown? Anyone? Anyone? It's true. It's true. Yeah, well, a lot of good answers there. We've seen, you know, the 70. We've seen area authorities, area 70s. Of course, you know, the oh, church right. is fluid, and this is one of the things I like about it the most is that, you know, the doctrines are there, but as far as administration of the church, that has changed a ton uh, based on the needs of the saints. And okay, the so uh, so these seven, pe- these seven men that you may have heard of them, Stephen, Philip, uh, those are the only two I'd ever heard of. There's also, <laughs> there's also Prochorus, <laughs> Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas. Uh, you'll need that if you ever play Jeopardy uh, at, trivial at church. Trivial Pursuit, for that matter. Steven, well, so Stephen was actually yeah, a, a, like a, a hero of mine growing up. He was one that I picked out as like a, a, the great example and stuff, and I, would, I loved him, reading him. Uh, he's pretty pretty rock-solid dude. has a, uh, a great story, which is in Acts 6 and 7, if you haven't read it. Um, which you should. Actually, yeah. Yeah, it's long, but read X six and seven. Uh, so so we're gonna we'll go through the part where Stephen testifies before the Sanhedrin and is stoned to death, and he gives a pretty lengthy testimony, which is which is interesting. And then at the end, uh, he just very boldly, you know, he knew like he was in in hostile country, uh, very boldly kind of condemns the Pharisees and and bears testimony of what's going on, and uh, and they stone him to death. In the process yeah. of the stoning, there is uh, Saul or Paul is holding the coats of the men, obviously, and so mm-hmm. he, him seeing this is a is a uh, a tie-in later. It's a it's a precursor. You see what will it happen. kind of is. It's like a cliffhanger almost. You sit. It's foreshadowing. There yeah, fo- foreshadowing. That's the one. Well, so uh, so the the well, sort of. the uniqueness of this vision is important because it's one of the few places where it's testified of a of a father, you know, God, and on his right hand is is Christ. The Savior, I mean, not one big person, but two people, which is very interesting, and uh, and that kind of refutes a lot of the. Well, it doesn't refute anything. People are just like, no, he didn't understand what he was seeing. He was he was dying. No, no wonder he reported. He was under duress. He couldn't have possibly known. Uh, I know. But yeah, so Stephen, great guy. I don't, like. There's a lot of stuff that you can take out of this or out of out of his story, but um, just on the surface, yeah. Phenomenal and what I, really, what I really love is the way he teaches, because he spends most of, uh, of Acts 7 reciting a lot of the history of the Israelites and how at first, like, the mighty deeds the Lord did for them through their righteousness and then how eventually they forgot them. And all of it was basically, you know, one big you know, allegory to the Sanhedrin as far as how they have fallen from the grace of God, basically. It was pretty, it's pretty awesome. Powerful teaching there. He does good work. And so, yeah, so Stephen, of course, he's run out of town, uh, stoned to death, and then uh, we yeah, jump here. Yeah, less, less run out of town, more murdered. That's great. But um, that's one of those powerful things. And like you said, Al, I love the uh, the very clear description of the Godhead in that sense, of seeing the two distinct beings. So we jump here briefly in the third section. Uh, Philip preaches and performs miracles in Samaria. Philip was another one of the, the men. He's out there doing his business. Uh, the people in Samaria respond reasonably well. They are, they are filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, one of the converts was a sorcerer named Simon. And this is kind of interesting because, uh, you know, Simon was doing sorcery. Simon was trying to do all sorts of crazy things. He wanted to have the priesthood for himself, if you might he is, remember. He is every missionary's dreaded convert. <laughs> Dude, uh, on my mission, one, I'm, not, I'm not even kidding. I had a guy that baptized his cat. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Did I, I ever got- tell you the story of the guy who was giving himself a blessing? Oh my! Yeah, he'd been a member for a long time, but it was it was awesome. He was just he was just put his hands on his own head, went to town. And when when you get those, you're like, oh, why why me? Why do I have to do? I'm sure Philip was like, oh wait, you're a sorcerer. You couldn't have brought this up during like the second discussion, where I could have avoided all this. Avada Kedavra, that's what I always. Yep. So uh, the point is, uh, Simon wanted. Uh, sorry, Simon wanted the power of the priesthood. I don't know. I don't know that Peter, of course. Peter gave him a good answer, basically that you can't. You know, we learn a lot there about uh, those who are qualified 
uh, to lead the church, namely a, a quote from President Faust, that this greatest of all powers, the priesthood power, is not accessed the way power is used in the world. It cannot be bought or sold. Worldly power is often Im- often is employed ruthlessly. How- however, priesthood power is invoked only through those principles of righteousness by which the priesthood is governed. Can you can you say yeah. Hebrews five four? No man taketh this honor unto himself. Can I say it? Yes. No. no well, you don't Hebrews have to say five it. four. And no I was being this honor unto I was himself. being witty, borderline clever. Let's move on here to Saul, Al, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, uh, in, in Saul, the, uh, the, so, so this is Saul that we saw foreshadowed with Stephen. Um, he's obviously engaged in very bad things now as a, as a grown man, namely persecuting the saints. Uh, and as he's traveling on the road, he is stopped with an angel, which the thing, the thing for me, I always wonder, like, like, I don't know, how, what, what do you do that merits an angel? And this is a genuine question. We have Alma the Younger sure. no. and, and Saul. Like, at what point of wickedness is the is God like, all right, no, 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 listen, I'm going to send old boy Gabriel down there to have a little chit-chat with you. Yeah, I mean, is it a point of, is it at, is it at what point of wickedness, or is it really there's some sort of a, a forward ordination or something, some sort of a promise of someone being capable of brilliant things? And does it get to the point when the Lord says, all right, I let people run their course, but this requires an intervention because I can't lose this guy? Does that does that happen anymore? I, it might. I don't know. I think nowadays I do miss the days of miracles of that degree. We see great miracles today, but I wouldn't mind having an angel appear on the road to Alexandria. It would be cool. Me. I don't know. Well, so uh, yes, briefly, we got to wrap this up. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so so Saul is, is changed from persecutor. To a saint, mainly, mainly because he's he has blinded this testimony. in this process as well. He, of course. he retells this story uh, down the road to a to a group of converts. Uh, just, I mean, it's it's that landmark experience that turns him from random. What was he a tent maker into what he is now? Uh, and he turns into one of the great, like one of the greats, right? One of the Saul. No, apostles. Saul. Saul was like a Saul was an upper up in the Roman. He was a Roman and a Pharisee. He was hardcore. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Saul was extremely useful. I think the funny thing if we talk about who becomes Paul, a lot of interesting things about Paul. He was ordained an apostle, but he was never officially part of the twelve. Uh, he also which, which, what's all right. Interesting thing about that: you can be an apostle and not part of the twelve. Yeah, uh, which we don't it, see much anymore. But yeah, like like Joseph, uh, who was it? No, no, not Joseph. Heber J. Grant, I think his his cousin Alvin or his nephew. I can get the reference for you, but he was ordained in a an apostle, but not a dis, or, but not one of the twelve. Um, and somebody asked him about this. They were like, "Wait, can you do that?" And he said, "I wish every member were an apostle. Like the 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 being an apostle is it has so much meaning, which we just don't even bother yeah. to learn about well, because we just say, oh, it's and, one and of I 12. think the great thing to and the great thing to to split apart there is that you know apostle is you know it's it's not a, it's a rank in the church it's you know a it's, spe- a le- it's a it's an order of the priesthood whereas member of the 12 is sort of like the calling that comes along with it right an apostle so, is a special witness of Christ well and, and so the explanation he gave though is he said you know we can't do this because it's confusing to members of the church or to the body of the church but like i wish that we could yeah so it doesn't have much anymore also of interest to paul he was a roman citizen which uh, gave him a lot of he was strategically valuable to uh, the 12, I guess we could say, given because of that. But I think that's where we'll end today. Uh, remember, brush up on your Paul, on your Saul. Ananias, he's very important in all of this. All of this is in Acts 9, everybody. A little, yeah. little fun fact. In Ukrainian, when he's met on the road, Saul, <laughs> or, or Russian, or I guess Russian, yeah. It's, it's, the angel appears and says, it says, Saul, Saul. Which to goin it now is like a Russian slang for talking out your rear. And so it's like, Paul, why, why, why are you talking out your rear to me? Come on. Instead of kicking against the pricks, that was always a favorite as a missionary. Well, I endorse the Russian translation. <laughs> All right. Have a All great right, week, buddy. man. Thanks, everybody. Please find us, of course, uh, contact at thisweekinmormons.com to send us an email. Facebook slash This Week in Mormons. We're Twitter at The Real Twim. And uh, thisweekinmormons.com. Uh, of course, this is Sunday School Bonanza, brought to you by those of us here at This Week in Mormons. Al, thank you very much. And, yes, sir. Uh, we'll all talk to you.